See, let me talk to Connor Rogers here because uh, I know you're unbiased, you're objective. See, Michael ain't hit nothing they said just now because Michael thinks that the Niners just work the media, Connor, okay? But I, I say, I, I heard a lot of stuff that made sense just now, which is no risk it, no biscuit. Now, I just finished, okay. Michael and I just finished railing against the revisionist history often associated with the draft, such as Jerry Jones saying, oh, yeah, we were going to draft Jalen Hurts, you know, if he'd have fell to us in the third round after we passed on him two picks earlier, a couple of years ago, just so you know. Um, but you are a, a draft expert. You do the draft for a living. I wonder what you thought of Trey Lance then and what you think of his landing spot in Dallas now as it relates to my hope for him, and I know Michael agrees, that maybe he's, he's Geno Smith one day. That maybe he just needs to sit behind the right people and, and, and it might take him a long time, but can he get there one day? Or maybe, maybe he just can't play. What say you? I think he can. I'm a believer. I mean, I had Trey Lance as a top 10 player in that draft, and maybe that's me holding on to the talent that I saw at the time. And here was the situation with Trey Lance. He was coming out of college. He only had one season as a starter. The COVID season absolutely wrecked his schedule where he only had that one showcase game. He was an underclassman. He couldn't go through an all-star circuit, of course, like a lot of guys. The really simple way to say it is this is somebody that needed reps. And he was drafted by a franchise while they have a great offensive staff and a lot of talent. The timelines didn't line up to be patient. The 49ers are in the picture in the NFC every single year. And Trey Lance needed time. He needed time to marinate. Now, my only question with the Dallas situation, and you could ask this about a lot of teams if they acquired him, is when is he going to get those reps to play, right? He wasn't there this spring. He wasn't there this summer where he could have got a ton of preseason action in that Dallas offense. Now he sits on a team where he might be that number three quarterback. But I will say, you're under McCarthy. You're behind Dak Prescott, who is a pro's pro. Uh, and when you look at Trey, he's somebody that still has all of that physical talent. He had some bad luck with injuries. I think the fit with Kyle Shanahan, it clearly just didn't work. And I heard you guys talking about the quarterbacks that have had success with Shanahan. And that is a long conversation, right? Of was this just a bad match? Was this a bad fit? I still believe in Trey Lance's talent. He does need time. And now he gets a fresh start in a place that you never know. Maybe in two years, three years from now, Dak yeah. Prescott isn't their future, and they like what they saw from Trey Lance while he's under their, you know, their microscope. He needs to get to All number right, two first and crawl before he can walk, Michael. Yeah. Get some, get, be yeah. somebody's number two first. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and this is totally unfair. Uh, Michael and Connor, this is unfair. I'll do it anyway. Okay. So <laughs> there are five quarterbacks <laughs> who went in the top 15 <laughs> in that draft. Five quarterbacks went in the top 15. No disrespect. So you have but. Trey. <laughs> yeah, Trey, Trey's at number three. So let's play the game a little bit. If they had taken, let's say, Justin Fields, if they had taken Mac Jones, I know injuries, all this stuff. But do you see any other quarterback? Did but they take it. the right quarterback? In, in, in other words, did they take the right guy? It, would, would Fields be better in San I can't Francisco? Say, I can't say I don't know what Trey Lance is yet at 23 years old. I can't say that and then say somebody else would have been better had San Francisco drafted him because the injuries. Like, as you pointed out off the top, Michael, and Connor, Connor, uh, Michael said this earlier, Trey Lance was a starter going into last year. He started the season last year and got hurt again, opening the door for Jimmy Garoppolo, who they were supposed to trade, but never traded. So who knows how it works out if they don't luck up and take Brock Purdy with the last pick in the draft. I mean, it's like, talk about stars aligning. This is star cross. He's a star cross career. And so... If they'd have taken Mac Jones and Mac Jones got hurt for a team that was ready to win right now, maybe it works out the same way for Mac Jones. You could say it about every guy after Trevor Lawrence, which is crazy, right? Let's not forget Zach Wilson yeah. last summer. He got hurt, missed a lot of camp and missed the start of the season and did not look you know, like he developed when he got back right now. He's been replaced Justin Fields in two years. I, a lot of promise. Justin Fields has missed a lot of time, too, and had to play through a lot of injuries as well because that much running takes a wear and tear on the body, but that's what the Bears' offense had to ask him to do. And you brought up Mac Jones as well, who, while the floor at times is nice for Mac Jones and it feels like floor is something Kyle Shanahan likes, 
I don't see the ceiling there very much at all. So I thought the whole move for Trey Lance going up to three was to chase ceiling, add a rushing element to a pass game that already works. And the whole thought with Trey was he's a well-built kid with a big-time arm that can run in between the tackles, he can run outside, and he can push the ball down the field. Unfortunately, he hasn't been on the field enough to develop those things or prove that he can consistently do those things. But the other three guys have had – not as you know, drastic of problems, but they've had their own issues yeah. as well. Two years from now, I wonder where we're going to be on Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, and Anthony Richardson, all of whom are now starting week one. Um, it's official after last night, D'Amico Ryans did what we all expected, was named the second overall pick as a starter for the Texans. Um, Bryce Young, we knew he, he was as pro-ready as anybody from the neck up. We knew he was going to start day one. C.J. Stroud, we presume that to a slightly lesser extent. Anthony Richardson is the, I guess, the one that's sort of a surprise, not a surprise given the owner, but a surprise given that he needed the most development. But hey, maybe the best way to develop is to play. That's something to be said for that. Was there anything you saw this preseason, for as much as you could judge the preseason, uh, that gives you pause about any of these guys starting day one, given that all three of them, and I mean, say what you want about Davis Mills, he's played for two years, All three of them have a guy who could at least, if nothing else, keep the seat warm for rookie coaches and developing young quarterbacks. I think ironically the one that I'm excited that he's playing right away is Richardson because coming out of Florida, it was that he needs to play. He needs to work through his warts. He was 20 years old on draft night. But he's, I mean, Michael, we were next to this kid you know, at the Combine and saw just the build he has. He can take on pressure. He could escape from pressure. He's got a huge arm. He's, they're going to really get in his ear to use that rushing ability, something that was great at Florida, but it can e- be, make an even bigger impact at the NFL. I also love the coaching staff pairing with him, Shane, Shane Steichen, who did such a good job with Jalen Hurts for two years. So Richardson needed to play, and I think he has the build – and rushing ability to take the hits that he'll be okay, ironically. There'll be bumps in the road, but Bryce and CJ I'm wondering about a little bit because Bryce has the size. Carolina's offensive line did not look good this summer. His real veteran to lead on is Adam Thielen. How much does he have left in the tank? Although he looks pretty good through a couple of preseason games. And then CJ Stroud, they just need more talent in Houston. That's the big thing. I like some of the pieces on the offensive line, although they've dealt with injuries. And I like Damian Pierce in the backfield who will get a surplus of work. But the pass catching talent is either in development like Tank Dell or it's just kind of thin. So Stroud, he, he's going to have a big learning curve because I think he's in maybe the most difficult situation of the three. And that's something you want to keep your eye on with a young quarterback when you think of things like confidence. Hey, guys, help me out here. Um, I'm wondering what we're missing. I can't call it. We're missing something. And you talk about, you know, Trey Lance and how the, the Niners missed on Trey Lance. And you mentioned Zach Wilson. The Jets missed on Zach Wilson. If they hadn't missed, Aaron Rodgers wouldn't be there. Uh, it's too early to say that the Bears missed. It's too early to say that the Patriots missed. But Trey Lance was beaten out by Sam Darnold, who was a top five pick. Uh, yeah. How many? What, what team is this now for Baker Mayfield, the number one overall pick in 2018? Is this team number four for him? So does it make yeah, you think... Right. We're just not looking at, are we getting too excited about college quarterbacks? Are we not looking at some key nuance that will tra- help you translate from college to the pros? Because I feel like I'm not getting excited about a college quarterback anymore. I've been burned too much. I'm, just got, I'm not getting excited about anybody. I'm not getting excited about Anthony Richardson or CJ Stroud no. or Bryce Young. What are we missing? We're missing this something. Gonna sound counter, this is going to sound counterintuitive. So the rookie wage scale you know, keeps young quarterbacks on a rookie contract and on a cheaper rookie contract, allowing you to build a team around them. And it's it's less cost prohibitive to cut bait. Quarterback Mm -hmm. salaries have also skyrocketed. So when you combine it being less cost prohibitive to cut bait with quarterback salaries skyrocketing, it equals less time and less patience for young quarterbacks. It equals like you you, like after after three years, if you don't know, we got to move on. And not to, not, not to mention the coaching, Connor, not to mention the coaching cycle turns over so quickly. You don't have time, like, talking about, oh, we married to this quarterback. Now nah, you dating him for a couple of years. Does that that's make a, sense, Connor? That's exactly it. It's Timelines is the word. I can't say it enough. You have a GM that could be on the hot seat or a coach that could be on the hot seat, 
and they need to make sure the guy under center gives them a shot at keeping their job or gives them reason to keep their job. And it can go the other way as well, right, for quarterbacks. And then you have the big decision that starts with ownership and GMs of if you pay a guy, like you said, Michael, where – you know, a lot of guys that might be average get paid to be great. I think of somebody like Derek Carr in the Saints. Carr's been an average quarterback throughout his career, but he is paid like a guy that needs to be great. And there's nothing wrong with that if you believe in the player and your system and what they can do, but it creates a more difficult decision uh, of when it's time. And that's why some teams would rather just kind of punt on it. And the Bears just went through this, right? The Bears, with a new regime, had to make a decision of, are we going to go forward with Justin Fields' development or are we going to use the number one pick on a quarterback? And credit to the Bears. They traded the number one pick. They got a great return. They're using a lot of those assets to build it around Fields. But that's a really, really tough spot to be in because quite often, if you're wrong about the one big decision you make, you don't get a chance to make a second one. So the Colts could make a decision at any moment here to uh, trade with, in theory, would be Anthony mm. Richardson's best friend, which is, you know, running back the caliber of Jonathan Taylor. Uh, deadline, I believe, is tomorrow, the 29th. A couple of things I got on just this running back market. Mike, we've been talking about it all summer. Connor, I know you have as well. <clears throat> I think Josh Jacobs, the contract he just got, and before that, the contract that Saquon got, that's the new normal for running back contracts. I think that we talk about what can running backs do. You can be good enough to get tagged, hold out, and make them give you more on a one-year deal. That's probably the best you're going to get. With a few outliers like a Christian McCaffrey or Derrick Henry. Hell, maybe B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs giving it their first-round picks. But you're more often than not, they're going to try to they, – they're, they're going to tag you, but you got to hold their feet to the fire and make them give you a better version of that one-year deal. But when it comes to Jonathan Taylor, who's not – who was on the last year of his four-year rookie contract. The hypocrisy is what I want to call out, Connor. And, and listen, I'm, I, Michael and I talked about it. I'm like, hey, it is what it is when it comes to running backs. It's, the, it's, just the, it's just the normal, the new normal. But when it comes to Jonathan Taylor, what gets me about the Colts is you don't want to pay dude, but you want a first-round pick, allegedly, right. for him right. from a team that then has to pay him? It's like, if you don't want to pay him, don't impede his ability to get paid somewhere else. The franchise tag does that enough. But now, you want Miami or somebody to give you a first-round pick, which I don't think the Dolphins should do it, or will do it, which means they will. You want them to give you a first-round pick and pay a dude that you won't pay. Just take two seconds and call it a day, Connor. Right. It's a tricky one, or not really tricky at all, because we could see right through it. We're smart enough to understand. You basically look at Jonathan Taylor and go, oh, yeah, well, you want that contract? Go find a trade that gets you that. And at the end of the day, a team that might actually pay him calls the Colts, and they say, no, he's our star running back. That's going to cost you at least a first-round pick. That's problematic. It's problematic for the position. It's problematic for the NFL. You could say it's a business as much as you want, but we know how important Jonathan Taylor, when healthy, is to that football team and is to their rookie quarterback. And going back to the rookie wage scale for quarterbacks, the Colts aren't paying a quarterback, right? When you look at Anthony Richardson, you're doing that to hopefully manipulate the cap to spend big on other areas. So why not spend big on who should be your most impactful skill player, maybe your most impactful player on the entire team in Jonathan Taylor? These are the problematic PR views of this. And honestly, when that's the case, it always starts at ownership. And that seems to be like the big issue right now for the Colts. I'm convinced, uh, Michael and Connor, I'm convinced that Chris Greer – and Mike McDaniel are in one of those Michael Smith PPR leagues and they're they're acquiring talent based on that. You know, we can have Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill and Jonathan I Taylor. Like, I don't, I don't Does like the dismissive fit? tone. <laughs> Does it one of those fit? Michael Smith PPR Does leagues. Does it Kyle fit? And We're I not feel sure. <laughs> we like the talent though. We like the talent. And, and quickly, does it fit though? You, if Jonathan no. Taylor is there. In Miami? It no. doesn't fit. Yeah, Miami. Well, you got a run, you got a run game genius in Mike McDaniel, right, Connor? Like the idea. I mean, I know Jonathan Taylor is great, but if, if this, so there's, there's another, you know, contradiction. This position is supposed to be so disposable, and you can turn Jeff Wilson into a star, Raheem Mostert into a star. You just drafted Devon A. Chain. What you need to go trade for Jonathan Taylor for? That's exactly, that's exactly it, right? You come from a system before they traded for Christian McCaffrey last year, the 49ers, that you rotate running backs. You find day three talents every single year, and you find guys that will take a one- or two-year very low-level deal on the market, and you rotate them all, and the three of them combined equal to a really successful rushing attack. That's what Mike McDaniel has really been raised under under Kyle Shanahan, and we saw Miami do that last year. So 
Maybe they make a splash, maybe they make a move, but with all the money they've spent, all the assets that they've sent to other teams for their players, it feels like doing that for a running back right now, it doesn't line up with logic, but like you said, you never know if they want to make that splash move. Michael made a snide remark about fantasy football, but I feel like there's some truth there. We all kind of view the, the, the game through the prism of those positions, quarterback, wide receiver, running back, and I think there's a story. I'm not going to say, Michael and I hate this. Nobody's talking about. I think there's a story that cannot be talked enough about. And that's Chris Jones. I mean, like, nobody means more to a defense than Chris Jones does to Kansas City, which a lot of people think can repeat, which their Chiefs Kingdom thinks this could be a dynasty. You're not getting there without Chris Jones. Like, just how dire a situation is this in Kansas City? And does his absence completely change. Now, we presume he'll show up in, in enough time to get in a crude season or what have you. And maybe a deal gets worked out at any moment. Who knows? But right here, right now, he's not with the Chiefs. If he doesn't get a deal and he's missing, how much does that change the calculus in the AFC, if not the NFL, Connor? It's massive. I mean, there's no way around it. With Chris Jones, the Chiefs are the well-earned favorite to win the Super Bowl again because they have the greatest quarterback on earth. And Chris Jones is one of the best defensive players in football. And I think Here's something that else that might be a little problematic with this, guys. We talk about Patrick Mahomes' contract extension, right? How quickly dated that became and how insane it is. Mahomes is vastly underpaid, but Mahomes has publicly been a guy that he does all the right things and he says, listen, other guys got to get some of the pie as well. I don't need to take all of it. And that's, it, you got to respect that from Patrick Mahomes. Well, one of those guys that the Chiefs should be giving some of the pie to again is Chris Jones because he's what makes their defense go from the inside out. He's a interior presence that disrupts the passer. He's an incredible run defender. He makes everyone so much better around him. I mean, Frank Clark wouldn't have had those years with the Chiefs without Chris Jones next to him. So he's their entire pass rush. You can't run at this guy. He's a leader on the defensive side of the ball. He's a superstar that takes over games. And when you have an offense that can score at will and counter punch at any time, having a franchise defensive player that can get create takeaways, even if they're not direct takeaways for him, but force quarterbacks into bad decisions and bad throws for the secondary to feast on, which is something he's been great at. Whatever they pay him, or hopefully will pay him, he's worth every penny. Yeah. He's a guy that's probably chasing the Aaron Donald contract, which is in its own yeah. stratosphere on the D lineman, and maybe the Chiefs just aren't balking at that yet. But honestly, they can't go into the season without him, in my opinion. Hey, thank you for watching Brother From Another. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. Don't forget, you can catch us three to four weekdays on PeacockTV.com and on Sirius XM Channel 85.